Uh, Caitlin, thank you so much for joining me today. I think your story is incredible. And the purpose led business you're creating is so important. I can't wait to share it with the listeners. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. So you are a women's health advocate and the CEO and founder of Gabby, a tech startup that's the first digital health solution that accurately and inclusively predicts a woman's risk for breast cancer and equips her to take action with community support. But before we dive into Gabby, I'd love to go back to the very beginning. What inspired you to start Gabby? So um, I think like most people who start companies, it came from a personal experience. And for me, it was losing my mom to breast cancer because of a delayed diagnosis. And I was only in my early 20s when she was diagnosed eventually, and um, she passed within seven months. Shortly after she passed, I started exhibiting similar symptoms, and it kind of felt like deja vu. So I started to ask more questions and do more research and really encountered how difficult it is to get care when you don't fit into specific parameters. So, you know, I was, I had a lump and even though I had a family history and even though I had a genetic mutation, I was just being seen by the physician as the 23 year old who has a breast lump and that's normal. They come and go especially as you start getting older with your hormones or on your period, but they just kind of weren't paying attention. Um, so finally I um, took preventative steps and they af diagnostic after diagnostic kept proving that it was concerning and there was something there. And I ended up choosing to have a preventative double mastectomy and in surgery was diagnosed with breast cancer and I was only 24. Wow. And so that, specific scenario is what made me go, oh my gosh, this, there's something wrong here and I need to be part of doing it. And I think especially coming off of the loss of my mom and then going through my own experience with something similar, I very much felt like I had found my calling. And um, so I, basically for the next eight years, I was trying to figure out what exactly that was within my calling and worked for a genetic testing company that moved me out to Portland. And it was then that I got to see how many other women were also experiencing what my mom and I both experienced. And that's really what drove me to go, okay, I now know more what needs to be fixed. I'm the one to fix it. And I left that job to go start Gabby. Wow. Um, I mean, what a story. I think just the heartbreak of losing your mom and realizing that um, had information be more been more available to her earlier on, she might have been able to take preventative steps. And then your own fight going through to even get the medical community to listen to you as a woman in her early 20s to say, hey, I think there's a problem that needs to be addressed and the mm -hmm. hurdles you had to go through to even get traction there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So from your own experience being on the healthcare side, and you have mentioned before that with your experience, you felt like doctors just didn't have the time to be with patients and really give them the direct information that they might be needing. Um, and myself, being a female, I would say on that side, there's so much information out there that it can be incredibly confusing about what you're supposed to be doing when a lot of the information is conflicting. Um, and it's it's not necessarily a clear cut path forward. I totally agree. And I think it's for, at least in my experience, um, I truly believe that physicians went into this to help people and they want to do the right thing. I think the nature of our healthcare system now is that they don't 
have the time that mm -hmm. they used to be able to spend with their patients. Um, and on top of, like you said, there being so much information, the real, I think, crux of the problem is that there's so much information and they can't keep up to date on everything as much as, you know, they have to go through um, ex uh, continuing education, et cetera. Um, but they also can't keep up to date specifically on you. And so it's it's part of her job, you know, it's it's both art and science. And the science part is keeping up to date with the medical guidelines and new scientific discovery. The art is how that applies specifically to the unique individual. And that's the part that is really difficult to do as a physician if you only see your patient once a year for 10 minutes. Absolutely. Um, can you talk a bit about how Gabby is structured? Like what, how you're trying to, to fix this hole within the system? So um, it all comes down to three things for us. So when we were doing research, when I was doing research initially, um, a, a, the first barrier I came across was women just wanting to know what their risks were. So let's say you had an aunt who had breast cancer or even an uncle who had prostate cancer. I was constantly coming across women who were like, you know, I've always been really concerned about my breast cancer risk, but I talked to my doctor and you know, she said, I don't have to worry about it yet. And for like 15 years, but I told her my aunt died of breast cancer and she still didn't seem that worried about it. I just have to believe that I have a greater risk or, you know, I, I just want to do something about it. So I was having that kind of conversation, hearing that kind of story from woman after woman. And for me, it was like, okay, women don't know the risks, but they want to, how do we educate them on their own specific risk. Mm -hmm. um, so that translated into our first product, which is the Gabby risk calculator. So it's essentially a, a quiz or an assessment that assesses your two year and lifetime risk of breast cancer. The second component is an action plan. Once I started talking with women who were very, very informed about their risks because of varying things, whether they're in healthcare or whatnot, um, they expressed not knowing what their options were or what the path was that they could choose because there's so much information. So now how do I take what I know about my risks and myself and now create a personal plan? So the second aspect is the Gabby action plan. It's interactive and it's based off of your risk, walks you through what you can do today, weekly, and long-term to decrease your risk. And as you're going through that action plan, we're tracking the steps you're taking, tracking anything that you find, say you find a lump that's concerning, sending you notifications on when to go to the next thing. And then the third component was, and this was very true for me and came through a lot in our early R&D as well, is that if there's going to be um, a difficult topic or, when you find something concerning with your body or have a question about, about, about your body. As a woman, we go to one another. We go to our mom, we go to our sister, we go to our best friend and ask them if they've seen anything similar, what it was like when they did it. So the third aspect of Gabby is community, leveraging the fact that we go to one another and leveraging the information that we each hold so that we can help guide each other along um, knowing our risks and taking steps to decrease them. I love that. And I think from a community standpoint, like sharing experience, mm -hmm. you know? Um, totally. That's incredible. Now, as you talk about the way Gabby structured and the three different pillars you walked through, it seems like that's an obvious thing that would be a super valuable tool. Um, I think one of my questions is how did you even get started? Cause while it seems like obvious and valuable, as soon as you start getting into healthcare, things are so incredibly complicated really fast. So mm -hmm. how did you even get started on this journey? Yeah. Um, I, yes. Um, 
it's it is hard and it's complicated and it takes a lot of research it takes a lot of roller coaster rides um for me it was a decision to leave my job because it was a, a corporate organization um i kept bumping up against walls i wanted to do more so i knew it just wasn't going to happen there but when i left my job i didn't know what it was i was going to start at first i thought it needed to be an information portal essentially like a web md that was women's health specific and i really just as I was giving myself time to not look for a job quite yet, because I would eventually need to have money to live, uh, it was just talking with as many women as possible and asking questions. And I literally, for like eight months, met with anyone and anyone, anyone and everyone who would give me 30 minutes to ask them questions, take notes. I would follow up. Um, and each one led me, helped solidify my questions and also led me down a different path. So that's really when it went from a women's health web MD to, oh, we really need to fix insurance. <laughs> and then that is a whole nother bear that I was like, I actually have no desire to fix insurance. So how do we support women and not have to fix insurance. And then it was, oh, you know, some kind of mobile app or for the, it's like a period tracking app, but there's more. And then um, <clears throat> we decided we were gonna be consumer facing. And, and then again, more research and more questions led to going back to something that I had worked with for almost a decade when I was um, in cancer genetics. And that, that is, are these risk models that clinicians use. And they run all this information um, through these risk models to assess a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer. And there are quite a few limitations in them. And I kept just coming back to these risk models of like, why can't there be something that's way easier to use, something that, um, women can use because again they're only used um, by clinicians and they're only for women who are above a certain age they're only for white women so how could we make this more appropriate for all different demographics and I, I mean really the long and the short of it is it just one thing led to another and it was just started with me talking I think I'm, I'm a big believer in if you have an idea just start normalizing it around people and hear their thoughts there's a point when you have to turn off everyone's thoughts once you are like really firm in what you know you need to do. But um, the power of just asking questions is what got me started. I love that. As you talk about it, what I was thinking was you had your own very personal journey at the start, and then you had years working in a genetics testing company. So this also very tangible information and seeing a problem, wanting to fix it, but then becoming a sponge and just asking so many people like, where, you know, is this the problem? Would this mm -hmm. be helpful? You know, what, what is being missed outside of just your perspective and your experience? I think that that's incredible. Thank you. And I'm actually, I'm going to grab something. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a therapist when I was younger, I was in so I was in college and she gave, she made this for me for my birthday. And she and I had worked together for a really long time. And um, I still have it today up on my wall because just like I was talking about asking questions, it's a reminder to me that to trust my intuition and that these, this is innate for me. So it, um, it says, why do you ask so many questions? And it's a little collage that she made because I was so, um, I think I was like an annoying kid and teenager. And I was always asking questions, always wanted to know why, why, why is it done this way? Why not this way? Why haven't you thought about this? And that obviously proved um, 
beneficial to get me to where I am now. And I think it's really important to not just accept the status quo um, and the power of asking questions. I love that. And I love that you still have that. (laughs) One thing I think about a lot is um, how much more important questions are than answers. Mm. And the reason I feel that way is that, you know, as us as individuals or as a collective society evolve our knowledge base changes. So ideally answers are not consistent, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You're, you're growing, you're learning more, you're discovering new things. And that's why questions are so important. It's continuing to come back to the question, because even if it's the same question, you can end up getting different answers depending on who you're asking or when you're asking. Totally. So for me, I'm a very like black and white person. I'm all in or nothing. I'm going to go big or not at all. And the aspect of the answer to questions changing drives me nuts because I want it to be a yes or no. I want it to be something concrete that doesn't move, Um, which is highly ironic because I was never really great at, you know, math or algebra, which is a very like, you know, two plus two equals four. You would think that I would be good at that because I'm a very black and white person, but I'm not. Um, Anyways, the ambiguity around answers changing with questions uh, drives me nuts. But I agree with you. I think it's, um, I think questions are way more important than the answers. (laughs) (laughs) That's so interesting. So as you think back to the journey so far with Gabby, what are some of the lessons you've learned or the unexpected wins that have happened along the way? Um, The biggest one, like without even thinking, is just um, the power of a collective mission, Mm -hmm. the power of getting behind something that is relatable. Um, you know, on our website, we have a list of like individual contributors and I mean, there's like 20 people who from the early days before it was even Gabby, before we even had a name, before we even knew what it was going to be people who donated their time and their energy and their expertise because they believed in empowering women about their bodies. They believed in decreasing delayed diagnosis. None of that has ever changed. It was always that, it was just how. Um, And whether it was around those specific topics or they had a more personal connection through their family or a friend or themselves. Um, And I think even to this day, it's, um, it's amazing for me to look back and hard to believe that so many people so early on, again, especially when things were not very concrete, just wanted to be part of it. So I would say that was the biggest unexpected win. That's incredible and so important. I think it's a reminder about how magnetic Mm. a mission bigger than ourselves is. And everyone wants to be part of something bigger than themselves that's important and that will make a difference. And that's what changes a job from a job, a means to an end, to a point of pride and a passion. Mm -hmm. It, um, I, so my mom was an entrepreneur as well. She was a national sales director for Mary Kay Cosmetics. Familiar with Mary Kay? Mm Mm-hmm. And um, she was a firm believer that she wasn't teaching women, she wasn't selling makeup and she wasn't teaching women how to sell makeup. She was enriching women's lives. And that's what she would say all the time. Um, And I, other than the fact that we had a storeroom of makeup in our house, my entire childhood, um, I thought my mom was a motivational speaker or a therapist because she spent so much time with women individually, just talking to them about their lives and their families. And I think that was the power of my mom in that role because women 
wanted that in their lives and could see how they could do that for other women. And it just happened to be around makeup. Yeah, that was like the the vehicle exactly. to a much bigger thing. Right, right. I love that example. Um, I'd like I'd like to talk a little bit more about the mission of Gabby and how that's impacted. So you mentioned attracting a number of people at the start who were very passionate about the mission and wanting to be part of it and donating their time. I guess could you talk a bit more about how the mission has attracted employees or um, created a culture within your company? Yeah, so um, like our leadership team is comprised of people who were in senior executive roles at really large successful companies like Nike or Cambia or IDEO and so I think just it not only has attracted people who are smart and skilled and have a common mission, but who are very senior experienced individuals respected in their field who should be making a ton of money. <laughs> um, and and that, that like the, the, the money part was less of a factor. It was being part of something greater, being part of, um, you know, a collective mission that was mm -hmm. making a difference. As far as the culture and the mission, I think because, um, and, and we're still very much uh, working on how this is going to exist within the company, because of course, over the last year we've been working remotely, um, we are still rather small. And so culture hasn't quite started to fully take place, but, as much as it can remotely and with a really small team, it's like, you know, starting meetings with what are our wins celebrations or something that we learned. It's um, if you had a really rough week or if, you know, something's going on with your family or something and you need to vent about it before we go into the meeting, like we're gonna start with that. If it's um, you, actually, this is a recent example. Um, I was working in person with one of my employees, and she was on her period, having terrible cramps. And this is probably my favorite example. She's like, I probably shouldn't say this. Ah, oh, no, screw it. This is a women's health company. We should be able to say this, right? I'm on my period. I'm having really bad cramps. Do you mind? And we were working, we work together in person like twice a week. She's like, do you mind if I go home? I'm in so much pain. And I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding? Yes. Like go get in bed. Here's a hot pad. Do you want some chocolate? Like, you know, let me know when you're back on Slack and we'll continue with this. And, um, you know, I think it's just things like that. That's what that makes me think of as you're talking is bringing the human side back to work. Mm. I hope so. I hope so. Yes. I know that um, I, I kind of get nervous and scared of when we get really big or even what, what that looks like, because I don't want to lose that. I think the humanness is really important. Definitely. One thing I thought of as you were talking about um, the senior execs who have been drawn to Gabby there's something that I've noticed a lot in some of my very successful acquaintances or friends, you know, that you get out of school and you do all of the things you're supposed to be doing, right? You, first of all, you went to the great school, you got the great degree, you got the great job, you went after the promotion, you did all of these things and checked all of these boxes that you were told should bring happiness and meaning mm -hmm. and satisfaction. And I feel like a lot of people, go down that path and get to what feels like it should have been the end where the trophy is mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. and they start looking around for like, where is the meaning here? Right? Like what, what is this actually for? Um, other than just another, another trophy that I forget about really soon. And so I do think you find these really successful people who've developed amazing skills 
who can be at the top of their game, who then start looking around being like, where is the job where I'm contributing to something that matters to me, that's mm -hmm. bigger than me and makes mm -hmm. a difference? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I mean, I just know that in my personal life, I went through that. I by no means was like leading the company or, or in um, a high up executive at Myriad. Um, but, you know, I got married and um, we eventually got divorced, but I felt like I should get married. And we were talking about having kids because that's what you should do. And buying a house because you should do that. And, um, you know, staying at the company I was at and moving up through the ranks because that's what you should do. And um, I mean, I was probably never more depressed and felt more lifeless when I was doing all the shoulds. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a constant practice to be conscious and aware of the shoulds. Mm -hmm. Because it happens with Gabby too, early on, I um, should have raised money at a certain point. And the first time I was told, oh, now it's time to start raising money. You should raise money. And in reality, it was the wrong time because we just now closed our pre-seed round, but I went out to try and go raise a pre-seed round a year ago. And I look back and am embarrassed that I went out to go raise a pre-seed round because it was not the time to raise. Um, and another example is I was told, and less and less now, but I was told so many times early on, you, not even you should, you need a technical co-founder. You should have a co-founder and they have to be technical um, because I am not technical. I am not the engineer and I am a solo founder. So if I had listened to that, there are many people along the way that I would have brought on full time. We would have split the company 50-50 and who knows where it would have headed. And now we have this incredible team. We're hiring more people. We just closed a really um, amazing pre-seed round with like leading investors in this space. We finished a pilot. We're entering into procurement with one of our target customers, you know, all these amazing things happening that I truly believe would not have happened had I followed the shoulds. I think that is incredible. Um, and especially as you're talking about the phase of your life where you were following the shoulds and where you were, how you're feeling at that point. And then taking a step back, looking at what you have created and the people you have attracted to this thing you're creating that now they get to be part of making this amazing company and impacting millions of women's lives so that they don't go through the same loss that you know your family has gone through for example like what an incredible thing you've been able to create once you stopped following the shoulds that's just amazing Thank you. Um, I'm sure do you have an example like that in your life too do you feel like that's a, um, applicable? I feel like every time I've become cognizant enough to, cause a lot of the shoulds are so ingrained, mm -hmm. you don't even realize it's a choice. It yes. like, it, you think it's a fact of life, for right. example. Um, but every time that I've actually questioned that and been like, wait a second. this isn't a predestined path or this isn't mm -hmm. the only way to get somewhere mm -hmm. and i think for me a big thing was around um forfeiting uh what i could do to gatekeepers before i decided to leave a company and start my own so mm -hmm. forfeiting whether i could turn this idea into a reality based on some more senior people would have to approve it versus mm. instead, so you're forfeiting that to a gatekeeper versus yep, instead it. saying, you know what? I wanna do this, I'm just gonna do it. And I can make the decisions, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, there's not a whole lot we can't do and that we don't have control of. Totally. 
I want to go back to your pre-seed funding round. So congratulations that you Thank just you. closed that. Can you talk a little bit more about that process and your early investors? Yeah. Um, well, as I mentioned, I went out to raise um, uh, another time before, and that was a total shit show. Um, and I think that's a great, for me at least, um, I would say when it's just, so, 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 so hard. And everyone's saying you're too early. You may be too early. Um, and looking back, I completely agree. We were too early. Now that doesn't mean fundraising is easy because raising this pre-seed round was definitely no work, walk in the park either. Um, and it's, it's all about just really getting to the no quicker because then that means you're gonna get to the yes quicker. And um, once one person, you know, invests, that brings on some other people because no one wants to be the first. So it's really sussing out who's going to be the first one to take the leap. Um, and then that they'll bring some people. And then once you have more people than the other people who maybe didn't even want to be the first or the early first, then it expands. And the next thing you know, you just raised a million dollars when you only went out to raise half a million. And um, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's long and hard. And uh, women definitely uh, have a way harder time raising money and are asked questions and asked to prove things that men aren't. But um, I am glad this round is over and I cannot imagine um, a better group of investors and team who's in our corner to lead us to this next phase of the company. So it includes um, the number one digital health investor in the world, actually, is Startup Health. Um, and then some amazing angel investors who are health tech specific. Um, they're big industry experts. And then it includes um, a diagnostic um, fund that is health specific as well. And their resources and network are just phenomenal. And they're really familiar with this space um, as well as a like multi-time entrepreneur, David Kidder out of New York. And then the person who closed out our round is Ann Wojcicki, the CEO of 23andMe, which is also super exciting. And then I, my, the most powerful money we received this um, round is from um, a generational trust. It is, it was put together by a husband and his wife. His wife is a BRCA1 mutation carrier like me and my mom, and she had a preventative double mastectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy because her mom died of an undiagnosed genetic mutation um, of ovarian cancer. So they put together this generational trust and they invested in Gabby out of the generational trust. And that's um, when he told me, when he made the commitment, um, you know, like my hair on my arms was standing up, like tear in my eyes, um, that was the most powerful and moving uh, investment that we received. And I'm just so honored to have them and everyone part of this. Um, that is so powerful. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Not to mention a lot of pressure. So I looked at him and was like, not only will you be getting your money back, but this is going to come back at a hundred X return. <laughs> How incredible though. Congratulations on closing the funding round. Thank you. Thank you. I love how you said one of the things you learned was getting to the no faster so you could get to the yes. And I think that's a really great reframing um, because you only have so much energy, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you're wasting energy where it's just going to be a no anyway, then that can't be spent elsewhere. Right, exactly. And I think the, the, another biggest piece of advice I would give about fundraising is that you have to run it like a process. 
you, you, and it took me a long time to get this because you're, it, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. You're having conversations with strangers, sharing information about your company, and then expecting a monetary exchange. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing to ask for money. It's an uncomfortable thing. And especially when you don't have you know, crazy proof points of X million dollars in revenue for X amount of years or something, it's just, it's a, it's a strange dynamic. So if you don't create a process and a system to like choose to move people on to the next category or not, and then from there, move them on and the whole time, not be telling everyone the same bit of information or at each part of the process telling the same information, you have to really create a structure and that's what keeps moving it along and, and gets you to the end. Well, your structure worked. <laughs> <laughs> so Gabby is set up as a B to B to C. So business to business to consumer model. Can you explain a bit what that means and why you've gone that route? Sure. So um, specifically for us, our B2B to C is we sell to the um, payers, which um, in healthcare, that just means the health insurance companies. And the health insurance companies provide our um, uh, uh, solution. So provide Gabby to their members. So our end users are women, but our customers are these health insurance companies. Um, and we went that way because uh, if you remember, I mentioned, I thought we needed to fix insurance early on. Well, instead of fixing insurance, the, the go around is, you know, insurance is pretty powerful. They are huge organizations. And, you know, when you think about it, everyone thinks about, you know, what is my salary and do I have insurance? Am I covered? Um, when you go to get a job. So it was strategic in that we would sell to the payers, um, but it's also just our incentives uh, are aligned. So payers want to save money and we want to decrease delayed diagnosis, which requires increasing screening and increasing identification, which saves money. So the incentives just ended up being aligned. Um, so that's who we're selling to. And um, we started direct to consumer and then pivoted selling to health systems and then pivoted to the payers. And that's when things really started to click. Um, and again, I think that's really because the incentives are very much aligned. Aligned incentives is so powerful. It's finding that win-win spot. So the insurer wants to reduce their costs, et cetera, et cetera reducing their costs with earlier diagnosis also increases saving lives, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so incredible. Thank you. It's actually, it's hard to go back and forth between talking about the consumer side and talking, you know, the health insurance side, because um, health insurance sure is measure everything in lives, but really it's dollars and cents. So it goes from, you know, talking about women and absolutely 150% what we're doing and what we care about is saving lives. You talk to the health insurance company and it's like, and we can save you this much money. <laughs> so it's hard to switch back and forth. It's lives and money. <laughs> <laughs> totally. But that is that intersection of aligned interests. Yes, exactly. And think about, you know, the people working at these big insurance companies that will ultimately all be using your product mm -hmm. um and how having integrated gabby integrated into their system can change how they show up to work every day right can also flip that switch from not only is this reducing our risk and our exposure for how much we have to pay out so like the dollars and cents part but you can actually put faces on this and names mm -hmm. on this. Like you can actually mm -hmm. see the lives that are impacted by this. It takes it from a spreadsheet to, again, bringing that humanity back into the workplace. Totally. And I think, um, you know, I, I just thought of something. So I get the opportunity 
to speak to people every day. And whether it's with an interview or speaking to an investor or on a customer call, and at minimum, one person a day says, you know, my mom, my sister, my family member, friend was diagnosed with breast cancer or experienced a delay in diagnosis or, and, but I get to see these people and interact with them and hear their stories, but, you know, no one else does. So there's a part of the community. And like you're saying for, you know, the insurers, employees, it, it brings a human face because how powerful if everyone could hear the stories that I get to hear every day, you know, I'm talking to like 30 people at minimum a week and I'm hearing at least seven people a week who have these stories. And what if other women could hear those other people and connect to them? And you know, it's not just women who are telling these stories either. So um, you're right. I think that's a, a really cool aspect of what we're doing as well. Yeah. And what a privilege to have people share those stories with you. I know. I wish I, wish I had a better way to like catalog or, or remember all of it. You know, um, for me growing up, maybe you'll relate to this. It was always like saving the, the special bottle or like menu or, you know, printing out the photo. And now it's just taking a photo of something or capturing a video of something. And where do you go to go see that or show it off or share it with people? If it's not going to be on, you know, Instagram or something, how do you, how do you keep the memory top of mind? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. Good thing to think about though. Yeah, yeah. Now, as you look towards the future, what is your hope for Gabby? Um, I see us as a household name that when women have a question about their body, when they don't know what to do, it's, you know, I'm going to go ask Gabby. Have you asked Gabby? What does Gabby say? Um, I see healthcare not existing without Gabby for women. I see us um, taking care of the entire care journey for prevention. Um, and I'm really excited to just be along for the ride and and be part of that process and continuing to hear stories and have other people join our team to be part of this. And ultimately, you know, our, our, our goal is to decrease delayed diagnosis. And so for me, from a metric and number standpoint, that looks like that number decreasing and that in 10 years, we are able to put out a report or, you know, do a press release or video or something that shows how many lives we've saved and that, you know, worldwide, we've decreased the amount of de delayed diagnosis that affects women. I love that. And I just want to call out how you very humbly said you are happy to be part of the ride. And I would like to say thank you for paving the way. Thank you. That gave me chills. Thank you. Um, as we get to the end, is there anything we didn't touch on that you want to share? Um, I don't think so. All right. Where can people find more about, more about Gabby and what you're doing? Um, our website is bgabby.com. So that's... Um, B as in boy, E, and then Gabby is G-A-B-B-I dot com. And we're on Twitter as well at B Gabby. Um, those are the two places. Awesome. And I'll put links to both of those in the show notes. Great. Thank you so much for this conversation today. And thank you so much for the path you're blazing. That's going to impact so many women's lives, but also their family. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited about it and was just, I, I always love talking about it. So thanks for having me on the show.